this time to continue our reflection and we're going to serve, wait for each other before we eat. Why don't you take this bread, remember a symbol pointing us to Jesus and his atoning work for us. If we continue just with our heads bowed, I'm going to ask Brad if he'll just come and lead us, giving thanks for the Lord's blood shed for us. Father, we want to thank you uh, just again for this evening, Lord, and thank you um, just that in times like these, these Lord, we uh, just can remember the wonderful sacrifice, Lord, that, that you poured yourself out upon that cross, Lord. And Lord, the pain and the suffering that you endured, we just think of the blood that poured from your side, Lord. Um, and that, that blood, Lord, is so, so sweet to us, Lord. Just washing away our sin, um, cleansing um, the vilest sinner, Lord. And we give glory to Jesus. We thank you for that wonderful truth, that wonderful reality, um, knowing that our sins are forgiven um, because of this wonderful sacrifice of Jesus. So we praise you. I'm giving you all the glory and praise, uh, worshiping you this evening. I'm thanking you, O oh God. Amen. Thank you. Also, please receive the cup as we serve. The cup for me is very significant in that it ought to point us to the work of Jesus in that justice is served and at the same time mercy is shown. Combine those two together and you see the love of God. And so Jesus, this is the cup of the new covenant. And that new covenant, uh, inward change, um, immunity from judgment, we rejoice in that as we drink this cup tonight. Lord, as we continue now in the service, but also throughout this, this weekend, Lord, just with this uh, added focus, special focus on your death and your resurrection, and Lord, ultimately your ascension and you being glorified. May we be as those, Lord, who day by day be walking in the way, knowing that this great great work is something that you did for ordinary people, ordinary sinful people like us. We thank you for that freedom. And even as being prayed tonight, Lord, the forgiveness, the gift of righteousness, inclusion in your family, Lord, an eternity ahead of us in the very presence of the Lord glorious and almighty. Oh Lord, may that be on our hearts and minds, we pray. Amen. We continue with our scripture reading in Matthew. Scripture reading continues from Matthew 26. Verses 30 to 46. That's Matthew 26, verses 30 to 46. Jesus foretells Peter's denial. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, You will all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will, will be scattered. But after I am raised up, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter answered him, Though they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. 
Jesus said to him, Truly I tell you, this very night, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, Even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all the disciples say the same. Jesus prays in Gethsemane. Then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little further, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it, is, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So, could you not watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, for the second time, he went away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. And again he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So, leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words again. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Sleep and take your rest later on. See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. This is the word of the Lord. All right, we're all going to consider that passage now and uh, uh, try and give some insight into the understanding of uh, what it is that Jesus went through uh, on that particular uh, night, that day in the Garden of Gethsemane. And so, Lord, as we come to this passage and we've sought, Lord, to read the passage, remembering that the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things revealed belong to us and our children forever. And so, Lord, this revelation tonight, as we seek just to uh, understand something of the ordeal, the struggle that you went through in that garden, that you, Lord, would impress it upon our hearts, again, leading us to that place of appreciation and gratitude, and, Lord, worship worshiping you as God, the holy, majestic, all-powerful, and glorious God. Amen. I think it's the one passage that reveals to us an intense struggle with Jesus on his way to the cross. And I'm going to, in my introduction, just try and remind you of some of what Haggai read to us where we see Jesus leaving most of the disciples behind and urging them to watch and pray. And then he takes James and Peter and John a little further into the olive grove. And the point is that he goes on to share something of his deepest feelings. How do we know something of the heart of Jesus on this occasion, but also helping us understand him in this uh, task that he'd come to do in obedience to the Father. And in chapter 14 of Mark, chapter, uh, verse 34, he says, My soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Now, one would imagine that that would have left some kind of impression on those disciples, that inner circle of his disciples, uh, as he tells them, uh, to watch and to pray. Uh, remain here and watch. My soul is overwhelmed. Uh, sorrow to the point of death. And then Jesus prays. Verse 36. Abba Father, all things are possible for you. Yes, the struggle. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but you will. Now let's not forget that Jesus is not only divine, uh, not only human, but also divine. And so there is this knowledge that he has. He knows what is ahead of him. 
It's not something that will be a surprise to him. Uh, he has been sent by the Father. Uh, God so loved the world that he sent his beloved Son. He understands in obedience that there's a mission to accomplish. He knows something of what that mission will involve and, and, and what it would require of him. And so there is this, this inner struggle. Uh, remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but you will. He then goes back to his friends, and, and, and can we say his close friends, his, his intimate friends, and they're sleeping. He rebukes them, and again he prays, and, and Mark tells us in verse 39, he basically says the same thing, uh, praying in, in the struggle, remove this cup from me, yet not what I will, but you will. He came a third time. He finds the disciples sleeping. And he said to them, verse 41, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? It is enough. The hour has come. Looking across to the Gospel of Luke, he adds in chapter 22, verse 44, And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. The anticipation for Jesus, a difficult time, uh, having told them even earlier, uh, aware of this ordeal that was going to uh, be something he'd have to face in as early as Luke chapter 12, he says, I have a baptism to be baptized with, and how great is my distress until it is accomplished. And so Jesus speaks in another place as well. Uh, John chapter 12 verse 27. Now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say? Father save me from this hour. But for this purpose I have come to this hour. Now what I want to do now is I want to gather together all these words. Different words that Jesus uses that these uh, authors are led by the Spirit of God to use to try and give you a picture of something of the weightiness of this ordeal in the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, summary, uh, Luke uses the word agonia. That's the Greek word agonia. We know the English word agony, and it can be translated that he's sensing a consternation there is appalled reluctance. He does not want to go forward. This thing is distasteful. It's not something that appeals to him. Matthew and Mark use the same expression. They use the word um, adomoneo, which simply means troubled. He's troubled in his spirit. There's a loathing aversion with severe despondency. Uh, another word that is used is that of perilipos expresses a sorrow or we would say a mental pain a distress that hems him in on every side something that he experiences from which there is no escape he is deeply distressed he's horror struck there is alarmed dismay now words are so inadequate but if we put those words together, we certainly must see this is not an ordinary experience. This is not something any of us have ever experienced or ever will experience. Uh, Jesus experiences what must be the depths of despair in anticipation for this great work that we recognize as our salvation that was secured. But what can we take from this? Knowing something of the heaviness, the weightiness, uh, the hardness of this ordeal, what in the garden can help us this evening in our walk of faith? And there are a couple of things I'm going to just touch on briefly. And the first one I want to uh, raise is, I want us to see how heavily Jesus felt the burden of the world's sin. We see it. I think day by day, I think we recognize our own hearts. Uh, we see something of it. Um, but the bitter cup, the bitter cup from which Jesus was about to drink, 
is more than we can imagine or even express in words. Some years ago, there was a film that tried to depict something of the physical agony of Jesus. Some of you may have seen that film, and there was a lot of brutality, which I think was probably quite accurate in the whipping and the crown of thorns and, and the nails that were driven in his hands. And, and, and I think the, the uh, producer of the director of that film wanted to convey that this was severe physical suffering. But it was more. And we need to see that, that this bitter cup from which Jesus was repulsed by was not just uh, uh, physical pain. It, it, it wasn't just that he was being flogged and, and, and that ultimately he was crucified. It wasn't just that there was mental distress, that he was being despised and rejected. We need to see something of the spiritual agony of bearing the sins of the world. And we have to make that distinction because there are other people. There are other, I'm busy reading a book at the moment. Someone in the church at Arcadia uh, lent me this book of some of the suffering that took place uh, before and during the Second World War under the, uh, the rule of, of Stalin. Terrible, terrible, terrible suffering that men and women and children underwent. So, so physical suffering is not unique to Jesus. What is unique to Jesus is the spiritual agony of bearing the sins of the world. Now, why, why is that? Why, why, why? There are two elements, at least two elements I want to raise. On the one hand, one who is clean has to take on the filth of the world. One who is holy, 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 is carrying on his shoulders the unholiness, the unrighteousness of the world. He was being made a curse. This is God. This is the holiness of God. He's being made a curse for us. He was being made sin for us who himself knew no sin. Do, do, do you get something of the, of the impact of that? This is, this is why he is repulsed. The, the indescribable repulsive weight of dirt that he will carry, that he will bear as he receives judgment. Justice is served, the wrath of God. That's, that's the one side of it. That's the one side of it. On the other side of it, bearing these sins, he would have to face divine judgment that those sins deserved. There's the, there's the dirt of it, the filth of it, and there's the punishment of it. And there's that mystery, there's that mystery that Luther exclaimed, you know, God forsaking God. How do you understand that? But that was what Jesus was facing. He will carry the sin of the world and suffer the punishment of for that he will drink in the words of job in chapter 21 verse 20 a wicked person was said to drink of the wrath of the almighty jesus is drinking the wrath of the father for the sins of the world and and so this is the cup that he sees and understands that he's about to drink containing the wrath of god can you understand it causing uh, mental pain disorientation of body, a staggering, a confusion of mind, in fact, surely an emotional kind of drunkenness. He was to become so identified with sinners as to face and bear our judgment. Jesus recoils from that. Now there are two lessons from that particular point that I want to raise. Surely, can we, in the light of what Jesus experienced, what he was anticipating to experience, that he actually did experience, surely in the light of that, can we ignore the offer of forgiveness? It's this gift that has been secured, this gift that costs so much, is a 
free gift to be received? Would it not be rude to neglect to receive that gift? The second aspect is in the, conte in the context of this Jesus hanging back in horror in the anticipation of what he was to experience, should we be careless and reckless with sin? The forgiveness issue, receiving forgiveness, but also walking in righteousness. That's number one. Number two, see the struggle for alignment with God's will. Now, Jesus is unique in that he's fully human and fully divine. But in his humanity, he's flesh and blood. And in his experience of life in flesh and blood, he faces the temptation and the trials that we would experience, that we do experience. On the other side of it, he's divine. And so as the deity of Jesus is lived out, there is this tension, this terrible tension between the temptation, the sin that he will carry, and who he is as divine, as the holy God. The anticipation of carrying sin, and so therefore praying the prospect of, of what he will experience, all things are possible for you, remove this cup from me. Now the point I'm trying to make is that the experience of difficulty that Jesus was going through is certainly worse than anything any one of us could ever, would ever experience. And yet in that, in his humanity, he's still willing to submit what the Father determined. Not my will, yet not what I will, but you will. Here's a, a quote that I found that I think expresses uh, this. We can imagine no higher degree of perfection than this. Something that I don't know, well, we certainly couldn't, but, but what was going on here? To take patiently whatever God sends. To like nothing but what God likes. To wish nothing but what God approves. To prefer pain if it pleases God to send it. To lie passive under God's hand and know no will but His. This is the highest, this is the highest standard that we could and should aim for. Can, can we get there? Not in and of ourselves. That's why we need the righteousness of Jesus. But we ought to strive for that. We ought to walk towards uh, taking off sin, uh, putting to death self, and seeking to be more and more righteous. Number three. This is perhaps a, a challenge to us and at the same time uh, helping us to see that there's hope. See how much weakness is found in the best of Christians. The inner circle of Jesus, Jesus and them, they're in the same place. He's with his close friends, uh, facing Jesus facing this ordeal. He had warned them of it, he had told them of it, and their reactions are different. Jesus felt this indescribable emotional pain and it causes this consternation, this difficulty, this terror and he prays. His close friends sleep. Peter, James and John slept when they ought to have watched and prayed and, and I've used the term the best among us. Wouldn't, wouldn't they be the best among us? I, I, don't, I think so, I think so. Though they were warned just before this that danger was at hand, they fell asleep. Though they had just come from the Lord's table with all the symbolism and explanation and the presence of Jesus, they slept. Though invited to watch by Jesus, watch, pray, they slept. The point is this. We are flesh and blood. And we will fail. We will fail. Uh, we are weak and we are vulnerable. And, and we stand in need of the help of God. We must be those who recognize our dependence on God, not just for salvation at, at, at the point of death, but every single day of our lives. Which leads me to my final point, which is just the challenge. See the importance of prayer in times 
of distress. If Jesus needed to pray, if Jesus did pray, surely if He, in His distress, turned to the Father, how much more should we? The, the clear pattern and habit of Jesus throughout His ministry on earth was to turn uh, to His Father, to spend time in prayer, to find place on His own, and so the challenge to us also, casting all our anxieties on Him because He cares for you. What I find interesting, just in the final word conclusion, do you notice how Jesus leaves the garden or emerges from the garden peaceful and with resolute confidence? So much so that when Peter drew his sword to avert the arrest, Jesus says to him in John chapter uh, 18 verse 11 put your sword into its sheath shall i not drink the cup that the father has given me he goes through the agony he goes through the struggle and reaches the decision of submission to the father's will and so we ought to be encouraged tonight that his willing determination to bear our sin to be subjected to the wrath of God shows us something of the extent and the depth of the love of God and the grace of God and the mercy of God toward undeserving sinners. So if we doubt, if we're ever in doubt, we always need to go back to the cross, always back to the cross, receiving the benefits, recognizing the very depth of, of the love of God for us as sinful people. And so, Lord, as we begin this weekend, as we consider even tomorrow again just the ordeal of the cross, I do pray that you would impress this upon our hearts, that we would not take it lightly, that we would not, Lord, get used to the truth in presuming rather than appreciating, rather than turning to you, Lord, in much uh, thanksgiving and ultimately, Lord, in the worship that we bring. And so continue with us, even as we uh, begin to draw the service to a close. Uh, lead us, Lord, in continued reflection and soul and heart searching, we pray. Amen. I'm going to read the scriptures again. Um, I'm not going to read the scriptures. We're going to sing a song. Thank you, Isaac. But we are going to turn the lights off at this particular stage. And remember what Isaac said. This is no uh, liturgical formalism. We're simply just trying to demonstrate symbolically the, the reality of the darkness of that uh, experience in the garden. And then, of course, the darkness on uh, what we have come to call Good Friday, uh, when Jesus suffers the anguish uh, of the cross. Okay. Just remain standing. I'm going to read a passage continued in that same narrative. While he was still speaking, Judas came, one of the twelve, and with him a great crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests and elders of the people. Now the betrayer had given them a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Seize him. And he came up to Jesus at once and said, Greetings, Rabbi. And he kissed him. Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you have come to do. Then they came up and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. And behold, one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. And Jesus said to him, Put your sword back into its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my Father and He will at once send me more than twelve legions of angels? But how then should the Scripture be fulfilled that it must be so? At that hour Jesus said to the crowds, Have you come out against a robber with swords and clubs to capture me? Day after day I sat in the temple teaching and you did not seize me. But all this has taken place that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples left and fled. And so, folks, on that note, we're going to conclude the service.
I am going to light this candle, and I do so tonight just as a symbol of hope. I remember as a young Christian listening to a sermon. Some of you may have heard it. I think it, if there was social media in those days, it would have gone viral. Sunday's coming. And this preacher repeatedly throughout his sermon, uh, Sunday is coming, Sunday is coming. And the point is, on Sunday there will be the resurrection. And so in as much as we've seen something of the darkness of the ordeal, but in the accomplishment of salvation, a necessary ordeal. So God be with you, bless you. Let's just leave quietly and we meet together tomorrow morning, either here or at Arcadia as we continue to worship together. Amen.